Well, good morning to you from NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, and welcome to today's mission status briefing as we take a look at STS-132. Atlantis's crew is now focused on the two landing opportunities tomorrow at the Kennedy Space Center. And here to give us more details about what's ahead for the shuttle is the Entry Flight Director, Tony Sicacci. Go ahead, Tony. All right. Thanks, Josh, and uh, good morning to all. Well, Atlantis and her crew uh, uh, had a very successful flight day 12 morning. They started readying themselves for their uh, return trip home. The crew woke up about uh, 1130 uh, Monday night and uh, hit the ground running. Uh, what we did basically as typical end of mission minus one activities, we did the uh, flight control system checkout, and that went uh, well with no anomalies, so the flight control system's ready for entry. We also did a reaction control jet uh, uh, hot fire, and again, uh, all the jets uh, operated as expected, so we have all that capability uh, to support entry tomorrow. Uh, the CDRN pilot also did uh, uh, perform landing simulations. They have a uh, application on board they call pilot and they get to practice uh, doing landings and basically uh, get that feel back in their uh, or focus back in their mind after a, a long dock mission. Uh, of course also standard end of mission minus one activities where we do the cabin stow and uh, get all the uh, feel con configured and all the things put away uh, to support entry. Uh, this afternoon uh, is pretty light. Uh, beside the cabin still. There's one uh, secondary payload of opportunity. You guys, uh, a simplex burn. It's a two ohms engine burn, about 10 seconds. And basically what that does, uh, they do that over a specific ground site and they're looking for uh, atmospheric disturbances uh, caused by the ohms engine's exhaust. Uh, and then with all, when, all, when that is complete, uh, the crew goes to bed around uh, 320 uh, this afternoon. Uh, one of the things, uh, that uh, uh, for the late inspection, the, the teams did review uh, the LDRI imagery and uh, the preliminary assessment shows that there's no issues with uh, the TPS. And of course, uh, they'll be discussing that at the MMT later on this uh, morning, and then they'll give the official uh, go uh, for uh, uh, the vehicle's go for entry. But again, uh, they're still uh, crossing the T's and dotting the I's to make sure they've checked everything. Uh, one thing I want to talk about, and I know a lot of you folks have been asking this the past few days about the weather, so I'll give you a quick summary about that. Uh, uh, there's, this morning we had a upper level low come through uh, KSC and we had the rain as you probably saw this morning, and that's expected to move out today, but there is a, a, a low out in the Atlantic and it's uh, forecasted to be about uh, 300, 400 miles uh, northeast of KSC. And of course, that's gonna have a, a, an influence on uh, the KSC weather tomorrow morning. Uh, let's see, uh, basically there's a, a chance of showers within the 30 mile circle. Uh, and of course, you know, you all know that it's KSC, so it's a 50-50 chance no matter what the forecast says and uh, we're gonna continue to watch that. One of the good things is that, uh, you know, we've been watching the trends for a while and they're trending favorably. So uh, our hope is when we come in uh, this evening or tomorrow morning, uh, that things will still be uh, trending in a good direction and uh, we won't have to work it that hard. But uh, again, it's KSC and uh, we'll get what we get when we get there in the morning. Uh, as far as the orbiter consumables, we have enough consumables to support out to uh, end emission plus three. As you heard, both uh, the LIO and the Cryo-02 are the limiting consumables for that. Uh, as far as the landing strategy, uh, myself and the teams put together uh, with the end of mission plus three and the current forecasts, uh, weather forecasts that we have, uh, and kind of what Josh uh, talked about earlier is that tomorrow we'll be trying uh, KSC only, and if for some reason we have to wave off, the plan is uh, KSC only on Thursday. Uh, but of course, uh, and well, KC only on Thursday and then Pick'em Day would be on Friday and Emission Plus 2. But as we wave off, of course, we'll reevaluate the weather and determine that maybe we want to move up to Pick'em Day uh, maybe one day early, depending on how the forecasts are in the rest of the sites. Uh, let's see, that's basically all I had for you guys today. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, let me uh, talk about our landing opportunities that I inadvertently over okay, there. Uh, tomorrow's uh, activities, uh, the crew will wake up at uh, around 11.30 this evening and the orbit prep will begin around uh, 2.41 a.m. Central Time. We're gonna close the pale bay doors at around four o'clock Central Time in the morning. And uh, our goal is to 
hit the first uh, KSC opportunity, uh, KSC 186, and the, the TIG for that is around 641 Central with the landing around 748. Let's see if we can put the, the ground track for uh, KSC 186, please. All right. I could talk about it before while it's getting up there. Uh, okay, uh, basically the ground track is going to take us over uh, uh, Honduras and Nicaragua and Central America, and then of course we're going to go over the Caribbean and uh, Cuba, and then once we uh, get to Florida, it'll be right over the Florida Ever Everglades, over Lake uh, Okeechobee, and then uh, of course run parallel to the coast before we. Uh, uh, do our landing uh, uh, at KSC. And right now, based on the weather and uh, what the winds are showing, uh, KSC 33 runway uh, looks like uh, the one, the prime runway we'll be shooting for tomorrow. And let's see if we wanted to, uh, if, if for some reason we cannot make that opportunity, we have KSC 187, and that TIG is at uh, 817 Central, and the landing is at 923. See, and basically that's all I have for you guys, and uh, I'll take whatever questions we have. Okay, we'll start off with questions from here in Houston. We'll go to the phone lines in just a few minutes. Go ahead. Hi, Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com. Um, this crew has been uh, getting ahead of schedule a lot, it seems, throughout the whole mission. They've been running uh, considerably ahead of schedule. Do you have, um, will you have words to them tomorrow about not getting too far ahead in the deorbit preps, um, or do you, uh, do you think everything will just, they'll just, work on schedule. Thanks. No, basically the uh, deorbit prep time frame is pretty busy for all the crew members, so it'll, they'll keep on the schedule. They, you know, everyone has something to do uh, throughout that whole four hours, so they won't be, it might be one little task here or there, but there are a lot of things that we have to have timed because um, based on thermal and uh, um, cooling capability uh, with the FES and all that, so basically they'll be on time for the uh, timeline. And uh, since the crew this morning uh, reminded us that this was the possible final flight of Atlantis, I wonder from your perspective um, as the flight director on console when Atlantis touches down, um, is there a sense of, do you think you'll have a sense of pride, a sense of sorrow? Um, what, do you, what would be your personal feelings of watching Atlantis come in for what might be its final landing? Uh, you know, one thing I wanted to say um, for all of us, it's been a great ride, but you've heard it from all my buddies that our focus right now is to uh, get the crew safely on the ground and, and complete the remaining two scheduled missions. And the way I look at it, uh, we'll have time to celebrate after we get the final wheel stop, whenever that is, hopefully a little bit later than sooner, and then be able to uh, talk about it. But right now our focus is on what we need to, for me tomorrow, make sure they get safely on the ground and then for the rest of the team, uh, completing the remainder of the flights that we have. Is that it from here? Okay, now we'll go to the phone lines. I think we have Marsha done with the Associated Press. Go ahead, Marsha. Yes, hi. Um, I'm wondering what the weather outlook is for uh, Kennedy Space Center uh, beyond tomorrow and how's the forecast look in California? Let's see. Uh, um, I talked about that a little bit earlier, but you know it's it's KSC and there's a, a low parked out uh, in the Atlantic, north northeast of uh, KSC, and that's going to have a uh, influence on the weather. And you know we're going into it 50-50, and then uh, as we get in tonight, uh, we'll see what the actual conditions uh, are, and we'll work it accordingly. I mean, I, we keep saying this, and um, but it is KSC, and we'll get what we get uh, when we come in, and we'll work uh, whatever uh, we need to. Uh, let's see, as far as Edwards, uh, Edwards tomorrow, uh, since we're not going there, I really, to be honest with you, I, there is some uh, chance of showers concern, but I haven't really put a lot of focus on that since we're just looking at KSC right now. I meant beyond tomorrow. What's the outlook for both places beyond tomorrow? Uh, beyond tomorrow, uh, KSC continues to improve as the uh, low mer moves uh, for further north, and Edwards is uh, looking good also. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, Tarek Malik with Space.com. Go ahead. Thank you, uh, uh, <clears throat> Tony. I guess just to, to uh, follow up uh, with the uh, the reentry, uh, I guess, plans going forward for the later this week. I'm just curious if, if that 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 expected improvement in weather is what gives you confidence to to not call up Edwards. Um, for both days, or if it's just, uh, you know, Atlanta has the consumable, so that allows you to make 
that uh, K is the only decision for the first two uh, landing opportunity games? Uh, it's it, more the uh, in the mission plus three capability because you know normally uh, of, you know all things considered being equal we just try for KSC the first day and that's what if we just have in mission plus two capability but again it, it all depends on what the weather's showing and what the forecasts are for the uh, other sites um, things are looking really well and like I said uh, support the KSC for the first two days and then uh, pick them for the third but again uh, as we as we do, uh, we'll just continue to reevaluate uh, if, in fact, we uh, should wave off. Okay, that may be it from Tariq. Uh, Bill Harwood with CBS News. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Tony. Uh, I just want to make sure I understood the forecast and make sure that if the forecast has been updated, I just want to make sure I knew that. Uh, the last one I saw from SMG, it was chance of showers both Wednesday and Thursday. And it looked like it didn't really uh, improve where there were no constraints until Friday. Is that is that what you're talking about? Uh, yes, sir. Well, I think they updated it. I don't know when you got your latest, but I think they were going to remove the chance of showers on Thursday. But I have to double check, Bill, because I uh, I was still looking at the uh, the old one. Okay, but thanks. It's, it's and uh, one more for me. If you if you tried both opportunities both days, I assume you have enough water to do that all the way down to Friday if you had to. Yeah. Thanks. Well, we have uh, seven opportunities worth of water. So for the first two days, or, or for if we sh should have to wave off we'd, and then go to the next day, we'd use up four of those. So again, pick them day would be, we'd still have uh, three revs available of water to utilize. So we, uh, we're in a pretty good situation wa uh, water-wise. Thanks a lot. Okay, that's it on the phone lines. Back here in Houston, any follow-ups at all? Okay, seeing none. Uh, the crew's going to go to bed at 3.20 p.m. Central Time today. That'll uh, wrap up today's flight day. And they're going to wake up later on today here on Earth at 11.20 p.m. Central Time. And that'll be landing day for the crew of Atlantis. Tony and his entry team will be on console around midnight. And then, of course, as Tony talked about, there's two different landing opportunities tomorrow at the Kennedy Space Center. Now, the crew, uh, right before this briefing, sent down some uh, words about their flight of Atlantis, taking a look at this 30-second final flight of this orbiter. We're going to show you that next here on NASA television, and thanks for joining us. Here we are on the flight deck of Atlantis again with the entire STS-132 crew. We have undocked from International Space Station yesterday, spent the day inspecting Atlantis's thermal protection system, and we didn't see anything wrong at all, which is no surprise. And tomorrow we're going to pack up the ship to come home to Florida the next day. I'm going to hand the mo mic to uh, Atlantis's pilot, Captain Select Tony Antonelli. Thanks, Hawk. Uh, Atlantis is uh, just a fabulous ship. Uh, she was a fabulous ship uh, in the beginning and uh, continues to be uh, just absolutely amazing. If this ends up uh, being Space Shuttle Atlantis' last flight, we've got an American flag here that uh, we're honored to fly. Uh, this American flag flew on uh, Atlantis' uh, first flight, STS-51J, uh, and I'll hand the mic over to Navy Captain Steve Bowen. It's a real honor to be among the 191 crew members that have flown on Atlantis in her over 300 days in orbit, 120 million miles. Atlantis is actually named after a ship of research and discovery from a place I happen to study, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. And she has definitely learned up, lived up to her name over the past 20 years or so. Now to Peter Sellers, who has done his own sets of research. Uh, Atlantis is absolutely my favorite shuttle. I've only flown on two, but she's still my favorite. Um, I hope that when she lands successfully, which I'm relying on these guys up front to do, that she goes somewhere and gets the respect she deserves as a ship of exploration. Uh, people like to visit ships like the Constellation, the Constitution, see where they've been and what they've done, and Atlantis is one of that line. Uh, I'm Garrett Reisman, mission specialist on this flight, and uh, when I was selected as an astronaut back in 1998, there were four of us in our class that were living in the Southern California area, and we got together to visit Atlantis. We were invited to come up while she was in for overhaul in Palmdale. And uh, when the four of us got together, one of the other astronauts uh, was also Tracy Caldwell, who was just with us on the space station. So we were reminiscing about this just the other night. 
And uh, we got together, saw Atlantis, and we all got so very excited about what we were about to do, uh, becoming astronauts. And seeing the tender, loving care that she was given there in Palmdale by all the people that worked on her, uh, it was hard to believe that here I would be uh, some 10 years later uh, flying on what could be her last flight. Uh, but she's been an amazing ship, and it's an honor to have served upon her. And here is uh, Air Force Colonel Retired Mike Good. <laughs> Thanks, Garrett. Uh, I've been lucky enough to have two shuttle flights, uh, both of them on Atlantis, so it's also my favorite uh, space shuttle. Uh, Atlantis has been on uh, 32 flights now. Uh, we're on 32, number 32, and uh, perhaps the final flight of Atlantis. She's been to many different destinations. Uh, I was lucky enough to go to both the Hubble Space Telescope and to the space station. Uh, she's also been to Mir and many other different places. So she's well-traveled and she's uh, served uh, many of us well. And uh, we look forward to bringing her home safe and uh, going to visit her someday on the ground. So from the entire crew from STS-132, uh, thanks to Atlantis and all the folks that have worked on her over the years.